Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture seven. So if you remember our lecture way back uh, last Friday, we were talking about encapsulation. That is how can we decide how to kind of package, contain, wrap up the things we're building in hardware. And that course touched on themes about software engineering in general, about just, you know, how do you choose, you know, what goes inside what function, what goes inside what classes. And we talked about those features available to us, both from Scala as well as how we kind of use those uh, in Chisel. So you're gonna kind of build on that same uh, thread of reasoning, right? It's talking about something called decoupling, which more generally is about just trying to make hardware components a little bit more independent from each other. And although it may seem subtle, it's gonna be a really powerful concept, right? Because it's gonna help us in two directions. On the one hand, uh, the coupled things will be easier to make bigger and more in and scale, right? As we get larger and larger things, uh, you don't want to think about everything all at once. And so by kind of making your components a little bit more independent from each other, i.e. via decoupling, uh, it'll be easier for us to kind of reason about those. Additionally, decoupled things uh, have fewer dependencies on the outside and are thus more reusable, right? Because it's, you know, a much more broad, simpler uh, you know, interface interaction method. And so thus, it's going to be easier to work with in that sense. And so today, even though it's about decoupling, it's kind of us continuing this theme of how do we package things up and work with them, right? So uh, let's get right to it. Um, so to cover that, we're gonna cover a couple of things. We're actually gonna cover Scala case classes first. Uh, it's one of these things that perhaps could have gone in the encapsulation lecture, but the way the content bounces out here, we are. Uh, but we're gonna talk about the coupling within Chisel, right? And the case classes will be helpful for not just today, but going onward, they're a really nice feature. Scala, I consider that one of their kind of their, their nice things. So uh, let's go ahead and load up our notebook. And let's talk about case classes. So. Remember last time we were talking about how Scala class kind of behaves like we mostly expect for a class. And then there's this thing called object, which is a special singleton object, you know, and there's only one for the entire lifetime of a program. And we often have a class and an object working together. Now, in this case, we call it a companion object. And a companion object can do things like provide a factory method if we want to have nice ways of constructing our class instances and such. Um, sorry, that's kind of like two concepts you're keeping track of in terms of classes. There's you no know, class and an object. Here's a third one. Uh, I'm a very sparing person of complexity, but I think this one actually provides benefits. So yes, we're covering it. <laughs> so well, what, what is a case class? Um, it's a specialized class that provides a lot of stuff for you from the language. And it kind of handles a lot of common uses where you'd want to use a class, right? And so what does it do? Well, it's a class in which uh, it only contains immutable members. And um, it kind of has the uh, companion object already constructed, right? So remember before we can create, create instances of classes, you need to say, oh, here's my class and then new instance setter class. Uh, don't only say new. Uh, all the parameters are already public and immutable, right? So uh, and here I defined a case class movie and I said, oh, it has these fields, uh, you know, name and a year and let's give it a genre. And, uh, I can, you know, go ahead and instantiate it by simply just saying movie like there was a, you know, factory map and a companion object. And uh, these fields are all available, right? So I can go ahead and access them. I didn't need to like mark it as val or anything. Um, that's there, right? And so in that sense, it's nice, but you can do additional things with it, right? So one thing you may remember from our class, we talked about making these classes immutable, right? We have immutable fields. But what happens if you want to change a field? Well, you can make a new version of the instance just with that one field change. And so what's nice about uh, a case class is it provides this dot copy method where you can uh, give an instance, it'll create a new instance where you can just change a field or change a few fields, right? So uh, in this case, you know, perhaps instead of having the movie the Avengers from the 90s version, we'll have the 2012 version and boom, uh, we can just do a copy on that. And just because they're kind of like this, you know, data store that's immutable doesn't mean they can't actually have internal functionality. It just shouldn't mutate anything, right? So uh, yeah, I can, you know, perhaps do some sort of function on it. Um, so we're gonna use these case classes for a lot of things, but I just wanna kind of do some right away today. I can go ahead and of course run this code. And yeah, you can see that case class also has some nice stuff where, uh, you know, it gives you a two string method by default. So you may remember previously when we uh, try to print out, you know, an instance of a class, you just see, you know, looks like gibberish, right? You know, some thing about the memory address, maybe some dollar signs in there kind of mixed in. You might see the class type 
kind of in that name, but otherwise it's kind of not very human readable. Here, you know, the fields are already there and it's kind of very nice. You can see here's the fields labeled, et cetera. So when you kind of have a handful of um, values rather than passing around, you know, four or five values, or whatever, just package it up into a case class. Nice way to encapsulate that information, right? And so um, we're using this for a number of things in this course. We said right away, like in this, including our next homework, we're going to use this for, for the parameters, right? So rather than having, you know, a zillion parameters, we can tie those up and package them inside of one of these case classes. Okay, so uh, let's use that. Here we are in Chisel. So, uh, you know, we keep working with this counter example. Uh, and let's say, you know, we've gotten to the point now where we want to have uh, multiple parameters to our uh, counter generator. We could put them all right here, but just to demonstrate the utility of this uh, case class, we'll put them inside this, this case class, right? So we're defining a case class that's going to contain these parameters for us. And so, uh, you know, it's going to have those fields. We don't even necessarily have to um, mark it as val. It should be able to do that on its own. Um, but the cool part is, okay, we can go ahead and encapsulate these parameters. You know, now it takes in not just those parameters directly, but, you know, this, this case class. You can access those fields, of course, by, you know, dotting into the structure. Uh, we've, we've seen this counter code a few times now. Uh, one nice convenience I've done here is I've also um, had the encapsulate the logic to compute the width inside the counter, right? So that's our the, the parameter uh, case class, right? So we can see that, oh yeah, our width is computed here. And uh, even though this is a method, because it takes no parameters and has no side effects, uh, the um, we can just simply uh, call it like this. So uh, this is, you know, example of using this all together. We, of course, can run in and see our Verilog down here. Um, the Verilog is not surprising. Uh, okay, so then uh, I think there's a question that came in uh, from the chat asking, going back to, you know, more generally about the case classes, you know, why is using new so problematic? You know, what's wrong with using new? Um, not a ton. Uh, it's sometimes good to be very clear that I'm sanctioning an object. Uh, however, if, you know, you're looking at how the code reads sometimes, this is a bit of a personal preference. Uh, I find that, you know, sometimes new can be distracting or just kind of spread out the interesting information. And so uh, having those factory methods, uh, number one, lets us do interesting things. So sometimes, as I said, as I saw the factory methods for building our class instances, we can have different uh, signatures. You can overload that constructor, so to speak. And so we can have those kind of choices there for us. However, uh, other times, even if we have only one constructor, in which case we could do it definitely within the class, yeah, I, I do kind of sometimes find it nice to just be able to, you know, say, you know, hey, give me this thing rather than give me a new thing. Um, but no, uh, saving new isn't a world-changing feature. Uh, it's just uh, kind of showing you in the spirit of the fact that, you know, case class kind of automatically provides a lot of the things you'd want with a um, companion object. Good question. Okay. Um, cool. So yeah, uh, here we've demonstrated using a case class uh, to make this counter a little bit more uh, parameterized. Neat. Um, so let's see what else we can do. Um, and so now we're going to get to the real meat of today's lecture, which is we promised was the coupling, right? And the coupling is kind of an abstract concept. For now, let's imagine a more concrete problem of we have two components, a producer and a consumer, and we want to have them interact. Right now, uh, as you perhaps you already have some experience with hardware design, uh, making combination logic components usually not too bad. One of the nice things about them is they're you know usually very easy to test. Components that have some memory or state sequential components, those can be a bit trickier, right? Um, and sometimes it's hard to get those right and hard to test those. And then you can imagine it gets only harder if you want to have multiple sequential components interacting, right? And so. We're going to simplify it out in today's example and today's discussion of just a producer and consumer, right? So there's one's producing content, the other one's receiving content. And um, the, the, the wrinkle to all this is, you know, what if the producer is not always producing? Maybe there's some cycles where it's idle for some reason. Or if the consumer is not always able to accept data, right? If the producer is producing a value one per cycle and the consumer is accepting a value one per cycle, 
a lot of this isn't necessary, right? But uh, if there's times when the consumer maybe isn't ready, it takes time to service these things it receives, or perhaps the producer has idleness, we need to have some sort of protocol uh, between these components to kind of communicate the fact that, hey, I don't have data to send, or I am not able to receive data right now. Um, so that's kind of why we need this handshaking protocol to kind of agree, oh, are we, are we ready to do this or not? Um, and so this kind of touches on some very broad themes you may have seen in other courses. And fundamentally, the issue is uh, an issue of control. And by control, I mean, you know, deciding what certain components do. Uh, and there's this kind of classic tension or trade-off between having very centralized control versus very distributed control. And they both have their merits, right? And that's why we have this continuing conversation and discussion of trade-offs, right? So um, this is not just a hardware thing. This is a systems thing. This is a computer science thing, right? So having everything centralized, right? Having all the information in one place, all the decisions made in one place, that seems like that'd be easier to get right, right? That seems like it'd be very efficient. You don't have all the information right there. That's great. Um, and when possible, that's good. Having all decisions go done in a distributed manner where, you know, people kind of make decisions locally based on information they have nearby and they can't necessarily know all the information and there's multiple people making decisions at the same time trying to, uh, you know, get it right and hope that, you know, they make decisions that are compatible with their neighbors are choosing. That sounds harder to get right. And it definitely is. But the only reason why you would embrace that complexity of distributed control is it's much more scalable, right? That sometimes it's not feasible to get all the information uh, to one place uh, to do it. Sometimes it's not feasible to build a controller that understands all the possible variety and, you know, number of information in one place, right? So um, I'm going to grossly oversimplify, you know, the, the thoughts in the field on this matter by saying that, you know, basically centralized control is great when you can do it, but at some point uh, it just is not going to scale, right? And so uh, at some point you need to go... Um, from centralized to distributed when the thing is sufficiently big, right? And so the common way of dealing with this is to have, you know, things be internally centralized control, but as you start getting bigger, between components is distributed, right? That's kind of the way I would think of this. And so uh, you can see how it might play out in hardware systems, right? Maybe we have uh, a module or a component that, that has centralized internal control, right? You know, it knows all of its own internals. It makes those decisions. It can do that right. However, there's going to be times when, you know, composing those components together in a bigger system, we're going to need to have distributed control between them, right? And so, like I said in the prior slide, right, in this case, we're talking about not even full-on control, just data transfer, right? Somebody's producing data, somebody's consuming data, producer, consumer. We want to be able to recognize when there's data not being sent and when the, uh, you know, consumer is unable to receive data, right? Sometimes it's busy or something. So particular wants to kind of have this ability to give a notion of back pressure, saying, you know what, I'm unable to receive right now. You need to stop sending me things or not advance the things because I'm not going to be able to respond to it, right? You know, I'm, I'm too busy. Uh, okay, so let's kind of make that a little more concrete. Uh, one simple way of dealing with this, you may have seen this in some harder hard design courses, is a simple, ready, valid protocol. Um, and so it's a great way to do producer-consumer relations. And it's kind of the most bare bones minimum thing you can imagine, right? where the goal is to send the bits, which is the, the data, from the producer to the consumer, right? And to track how feasible it is, there's these single bit signals from the producer and consumer indicating uh, their status, right? So if the producer has data to send, it asserts one, you know, sends a one signal on the valid line. Uh, meanwhile, if the consumer is ready to receive, it sends a one out on this uh, line. And you can notice how these wires are going in different directions, right? They're talking to each other. Um, and so well, the question, of course, is when does the transfer occur? It occurs on a clock cycle in which both ready and valid are true in the same cycle, right? There might be situations in which, you know, maybe one cycle valid is true, but ready is not, or, or, or ready is true, but valid is not. And th those are not going to be a transfer, right? Because if only one of those is, is true, but not the other one, that means for some reason why it's not a transfer is possible, right? For example, if valid is true and ready is not true, that means, yes, I have data to send, but they aren't able to receive it, so I shouldn't move forward because they aren't receiving it. Uh, and it's kind of this classic thing of, you know, if you're speaking and nobody's listening, why are you speaking, right? And it's this kind of same thing right here where, yes, I can put data in a wire, but if the person I'm trying to send it to isn't actually listening to it, I shouldn't advance, right, if I care about them receiving what I'm trying to send. Um, same thing true for the consumer, right? If I'm ready, 
and I have a one here, but it's valid as false, zero, that means there's no useful data coming in. I need to recognize that that's garbage or you know idle and uh, not, not accept that, right? So the transfer kind of requires both sides agreeing, yes, I have data to send, and yes, you are ready to receive it, right? The data I'm sending is valid, and you're ready to receive it, right? So both sides are agreeing at the same time to do this, right? And so this is a simple, what's called ready valid protocol. There's a surprisingly large uh, research space on subtle nuances, these sorts of protocols, how to do this efficiently in hardware, kind of changing semantics to be a little bit more elastic in some cases. Uh, our own uh, professor, Jose Renau here in our department has some interesting research in this area. Um, but ready valid is kind of a very simple thing and you often see things, if it's not ready valid, it's probably close to it uh, in a lot of hardware designs. So, okay. We have this notion we want to have ready and valid coming, going between you know, the producer and consumer. So naturally the question is, well, what can we do in a chisel language or library to make it easier for us to do this? Um, so it turns out that you know, it's such a common operation that this is basically built into the chisel library and we can use a lot of nice functionalities in Scala and chisel to kind of package this up, right? And what's cool about this is when things are in the library and you're able to use them and it solves your problems, right? Remember, it's not just less code you're writing, uh, it's less chance for you to make bugs because hopefully the library components are correct. But also it improves readability, right? This is other thing you keep bringing up, right? Where if someone's a you know, seasoned uh, Chisel developer and they're new to your code base, uh, if you use library components, those are things they already know how they work, they already know the APIs, and that's something they can just kind of read and deal with much quicker, right? And so when library components exist and they do your job, use them, right? It's, it's, it's a really good practice, right? Um, so let's talk about what the library provides, right? Well, particular what it does is it helps us deal with the declarations, right? If you go back to the prior slide, you'll see that, you know, originally I just wanted to send some data from producer to consumer, right? And even this simple ready valid protocol, I actually need to kind of have some additional wires to track this, right? I need to have, you know, a valid that markets good data and a ready going in the opposite direction. And so to kind of capture that, uh, there's just a couple keyword you can use inside uh, just from Chisel Library that will help us deal this, right? And so what these library functions are going to do is they're going to provide, uh, they're automatically going to declare the needed signals, right? So I can have, say, I want this data value to be decoupled and under the hood, it's going to go ahead and declare ready and valid signals for us and put them in the right directions and that kind of stuff. There's also some helpful uh, helper functions, right? That are going to help us do some common operations. And uh, by default, you should think of, when you look at a, a wire and you see decoupled or valid, it's going in the output direction and it's going to automatically, you know, declare things in reverse direction when, when appropriate. If you want to have it be on the input direction, you need to call flip, which you saw before, right? You kind of need to keep track of what's output, what's input. It's a practice I still do sometimes. I still sometimes just draw a box and have to kind of draw that arrow going in and now I remind myself, okay, from the point of view of this box, what's an input, what's an output, right? And you got to kind of remind yourself which way the wires are going. In terms of what the library provides, it actually provides two things. The protocol I've been describing so far, they call the coupled, which has both ready and valid. Uh, so the, the, the kind of key thing is that, you know, uh, valid, um, it allows us to indicate the data as, you know, useful data cycle. Ready is the way for the receiver to declare back pressure. Um, and if it's not ready, it's not ready to receive. Uh, there's a simpler protocol, which is just a valid protocol. And that's simply just a way for the producer to indicate that the data is potentially uh, either valid, you know, useful data should be reprocessing or invalid if I'm idle and you shouldn't be looking at it. Uh, but it kind of has an assumption, well, if we only have valid but no ready, that means there's no way for the consumer to say no, right? There's no way for it to have back pressure. So in situations where you have a dedicated consumer and it's always able to receive, this is probably fine a lot of times, right? You can say, hey, you know what? I know you have no choice. You're taking this data. I just want you to know this is real data versus this is, you know, idle data in the middle of a, you know, uh, a, a calm period, right? And so if you think about it in some ways, this valid, where it's just marking only valid, it's kind of like a Scala option, right? We talked about options last week where it's like, oh wait, what if I have a value and I want to indicate this value potentially is empty? That's what valid is like. It's saying, you know what, there's a data bus here uh, and you know, I know you're watching it, but this cycle, there's nothing there, right? So be aware there's nothing there. Do what you need to do, but don't munch on this garbage data and then you know what there, there is something here be aware of it cool and then uh you know of course i linked to the uh scala pages right you can see the you know docs on these um so one thing that comes up with the coupled actually wait, i'll pause here for questions and then i'll move on for a second um okay 
So one thing that comes up uh, a few times in tower design, especially when you're dealing with ready valid signaling sometimes, is something called a combinational loop. And so uh, a combinational loop uh, is a case I'll cover in the next slide, but it's basically when you have uncontrolled feedback. And this emerges with ready valid signaling because sometimes if you make your you know, ready or valid signal dependent on the other, on you know, let's say if you go back a slide, I'm trying to figure out the logic for, you know, ready and the logic I'm using to compute ready considers valid. There's a combinational path here. Um, that is a little worrisome, but in of itself, okay, because you can see there's, you know, data going through here, you know, the signal goes through here, has a loop, comes back here, that's fine. Where you get into trouble is if the logic for ready depends on the value for valid as well as the logic for valid depends on the value for, for ready, right? In which case, wait, that's a loop, right? There's, there's no, um, uh, how does it solve that, right? And the answer is it can't. So uh, this is a common place where students sometimes might run into this error message in Chisel. You may have seen it already in homework one. Um, but ready val is a common place where this comes up, especially when you're using some of these library functions where you may not be fully aware of what's going on under the hoodie. So let's talk about how much this a little bit more, right? So like I said, so I called it, a uncontrolled feedback path, right? In other words, let's like see this example right here, where if you have an adder and you're you know, taking the output of the adder and feeding it right back into itself, what's that value supposed to be, right? It's gonna be like, a, like a, some sort of you know, race, right? Where it's like, oh, it's some value. And actually, at least as circuits, they can be wildly unpredictable, right? Um, they may update in weird orders, the values can be hard to predict. In worst cases, uh, you can read something called metastability, where it's locked into some value that's not changing, but that value is um, neither one or zero. Uh, that's a disaster, right? Your hardware kind of locks up and you know, it's, it's not good. So the solution is you don't want to have uncontrolled feedback paths, right? You want to have things go through state elements. So state elements are things like registers and memories. And what's nice about them is one of the key things we use these is it goes in for synchronization, right? Or by going to register it only updates once per cycle, we're kind of, you know, moderating that feedback path potentially right now. Now, you aren't required to put registers in feedback paths, but, sorry, uh, registers can be used in places outside of feedback paths, but if there is a feedback path, by putting a register there, uh, you can moderate that feedback, right? You can say, hey, you know what, only update once per cycle, and it's very clear, okay, here's the old value, here's the new value, there's time for things to settle. It kind of works out, right? And so, in general, you don't want combinational loops. Um, there are some exceptions where, you know, if you really, really know what you're doing, you can prove, you know what, even though it's a combination loop, it's guaranteed to converge under, you know, all conditions. Uh, people will do something called asynchronous logic. Their entire design is basically one giant combination loop. They know why they're doing this. They know they have a purpose to do it. But by default in Chisel and Fertile, uh, it actually will flag this as an error because they, they're pretty sure you don't want to be doing this. So, for example, if I wrote a counter without a register, and this logic on the left kind of corresponds with what's on the right, uh, it's going to yell at us, right? Because it's going to say, hey, you have a combinational loop. <laughs> um, so this is, you know, the, the fertile warning. Um, and it's saying, hey, and it's actually trying to help you trace it, right? So um, sometimes these messages are helpful. Sometimes the names aren't quite helpful because you can't see what the actual code is. But, you know, in this case, you can see something involving count and count it plus one. So, yeah, so you can see the issue is involving count. Yeah, I mean, here I'm defining the value of count relative to itself plus one, right? Um, and because, you know, this is uh, a wire and this is, you know, uh, a value, this is logic, right? There's no delay here, no uh, synchronization or anything, right? So this is why this is, you know, uncontrolled feedback path and this is problematic. Now, if I was to put a register in there, this is perfectly fine, right? I have a register, uh, I guess I can't quite see it too easily, but if you scroll down, oops, I didn't mean to do that much. Um, you can see, yeah, there's a reg, it's doing the right thing, uh, et cetera. Um, and so, yeah, so this is kind of more generally about combination loops. And if you see one of these, uh, you know, what should you do? Well, you should try to, if you can, read that error message and it gives you helpful things, work based on those, right? Um, you know, hey, it's telling me something involving this. But like, for example, in this case, it's not too helpful because it didn't print out the Verilog, right? So I don't know what it's referring to. And it says, you know, I owe count underscore T versus underscore T minus one, right? Um, but that might still get you in the right area and you can kind of look at it. Um, the other option you may consider is using that visualize tool we have in the notebooks. I'm not going to run it right now because uh, my laptop doesn't have GraphBiz installed. Um, and so it's kind of 
the thing to be aware of. Okay, so this is about uh, combinational loops. Any questions on them? Okay, so yeah, so combinational loops, this is kind of a pre-planned aside in this decoupling lecture because, like I said, this is a very common issue where people are writing their own ready-valid signals. They sometimes make ready depend on valid or valid depend on ready. And it turns out, if you actually do it only on one side, that's okay. It's not going to be a fully closed loop. But doing it on both sides, there, that's where you get yourself, right? Uh, and sometimes you have bigger, more complicated designs. This kind of creeps up on you. You do it on one side, and you think about it. Then you do it on the other side, and all of a sudden, boom, you have a combinational loop. Um, so, yeah, uh, we talked about them. Hopefully, you can avoid it. Uh, best case scenario, you can make the things that determine ready or valid. Make that depend on things, you know, from within that module, and then you kind of can avoid it. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and make the thing back to the same size uh, and see an example of valid, right? Remember, we had these two different versions. We had valid and decoupled. Valid is the way of marking that something is, as the name implies, valid. So, uh, this is a really simple example where we have a module that's going to, you know, have data coming in, data going out. Um, and let's say, you know, on my side of design, I use this convention of using enable or en to mark things that are good. And now I'm going to kind of make this more standardized by making it go through the valid uh, interface, right? So we're going to declare it by just saying valid. And so, yeah, we can see here, for example, I call this, hey, out is going to be valid. Valid is going to go ahead and under the hood, you know, create a dot bits and a dot valid signal for us, right? So we need to set both of those. And so, yeah, if I go ahead and generate this Verilog, uh, we can kind of see what turns out. But here we declare it as only one thing, but this, you know, library component, you know, is, okay, you want to have out? Well, there's the data you care about and there's this single bit valid, right? So you can see the data we cared about. Uh, bits is, you know, four bits because we said the thing would be four, right? Uh, and then there's this one bit uh, valid signal kind of attached to it. And well, we assign these based on the other inputs and you can see those assignments uh, here. Okay, so here's a, you know, kind of an example of declaring a valid. And so the question is, uh, A, is valid of type output? Uh, the way I would think of it is I would think of valid as being uh, by default in the output direction, right? So that's kind of a comment a few slides ago about valid versus a couple. They're both kind of in the uh, output direction by default. So yes, valid, which has only a bits and a valid. Yes, those by default are in the output direction. But remember, if I was to do the couple, there's also a ready going in the opposite direction. And if we need to flip these, we can do uh, flipped. Although I think if I call flipped here, uh, it's going to yell at me because the assignments are in the wrong direction. But uh, or I'm going to hang my own interpreter. Uh, OK, let's hopefully I can get out of it. Um, great. But yeah, so this, this, this is an example of just valid. So here we have a module, which is, you know, producing valid. So there's a bits and a valid signal. And yeah, we're just kind of assigning those and passing them through. Uh, so um, let's actually try using this perhaps maybe over time to see how it behaves. And so in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to do the reverse, right? So we're going to have something receiving a valid. So Here's that thing I was just talking about where we have an incoming port. It's a valid, so it's going to have that valid you know, bit appended to it, right? And we want it to be in, in, input, right? So we're going to flip it, right? So by default, valid and the couple are kind of output. So if we want it to be input, we need to flip it. Um, and all this receiving module is going to do is when the input is valid, it's going to say it received it, right? So here we are doing something that's not really real hardware, but I think we can kind of appreciate the constructs here, um, right? Because printf isn't a thing in hardware, but it is just fine in simulation. So uh, in our simulation, right, we're going to, you know, uh, run for, you know, eight cycles. And every cycle, we're going to send in the cycle number and the input. Why not? And then the interesting thing is we're going to um, make them valid only half the time, right? So half the cycles, in particular, on the even cycles, we're going to make valid equal to one. And on the odd cycles, val is going to be zero, right? So if we go ahead and run this, we can see, for example, on cycle zero, uh, we're going to go ahead and poke valid being one. So yeah, it's going to say received it, right? Cycle one, we're going to poke a, a zero into valid. And so because valid is, you know, false, this one's not going to be active. 
And then cycle two, uh, same thing. We're going to go ahead and now we're going to poke a one in there. One, we're going to receive it, and you can kind of see this behavior right here, right? And so um, this is kind of an example just showing this valid uh, interface at work where, you know, when there's legitimate data, valid is one, and when valid is zero, we ignore it. Uh, and this uh, valid, you know, library function, like I said, is kind of in the, the way I would phrase it is by default, it's kind of in the output direction. But, you know, if we need to make an input, we can just flip it. And so naturally, when we have a connection, right, we're going to have one side being an output, one side being an input. So one module is going to declare valid, one module is going to declare, you know, flipped valid. Cool, great. Uh, other questions? Um, oh, so the question is, when I flipped valid, does that somehow turn like valid into ready? Uh, not quite, right? Uh, it's a very good question. So let's go back maybe to that picture. Maybe it's better to explain over here. So yes, valid and ready go in opposite directions. But the way to think of it, and the way to think of any hardware signal when you have an output versus an input is the output is the producer, the input is the consumer, right? And so the way to think of it is that um, valid, somebody's producing valid, and someone's acting on valid. Somebody's producing ready, someone's acting on ready as a way to think of it, right? And so um, as if I'm declaring a uh, valid interface, that means there's no ready signal, it's just bits and valid. You see, the producer has these as outputs. The consumer has these as inputs, right? But the kind of key point is it's not so much a ready signal. No, it's a valid signal on, from the input side, right? In the sense that I'm trying to see if the thing I'm receiving uh, is legitimate data, right? Uh, that's what valid is indicating. Um, likewise, the ready signal, right, uh, from one side is an output, from one side is an input, right? So from the consumer's point of view, where it's an output, right, I'm saying, yes, I'm ready to receive. Uh, but on the producer side, which is taking the ready as an input, is using this to understand, uh, did the consumer actually accept my data, right? Because, um, you know, just because I have valid data going out of here doesn't mean I can advance unless ready was also true to same cycle, right? And so, yeah, so it's one of these things where you kind of keep track of what is input, what is output. Um, and like I said, I, I recommend drawing diagrams like this one right here if you need to keep you straight for yourself about, from the point of view of a certain module, what's input, what's output, you know, who's going to where. Uh, these kind of diagrams are very helpful tools. Um, and it doesn't need to be, you know, really fancy. It can be on the scratch paper in the corner and you'd be done with it and toss it out. But um, yeah, it's good to kind of get a handle on um, what's input and output. Good question. Okay, so here we've done just that valid. We can now also use the decoupled, which remember includes the ready and the valid. Um, so, uh, you can see here we're just declaring, you know, our output to be uh, decoupled. And we know under the hood that's going to, you know, instantiate, you know, split up into a bits, a ready signal and a valid signal. The ready signal is going in the opposite direction. The coupled and valid are by default in the output direction so that those are going to be in the output direction. What is this module doing? Well, uh, hopefully I gave you a hint with the name count when ready. So what it's going to be is going to be a counter that has both a Input from one side that's, you know, enables, is it enabled at all? And then it's also going to um, only count when the output's ready to receive, right? So it's looking at the io.out.ready. Notice how we can see, right? Okay, here we declared io.out. Where did dot .ready come from? Dot .ready came from this use of the coupled library feature, which is going to go ahead and make out have a dot .bits, a dot .ready, and a dot .valid, right? And so uh, for the counter itself, we're going to go ahead and use that standard library component from the Chisel library. No reason to need to reinvent the wheel if we don't have to. Uh, so we're going to use that counter. And you can see, yes, yeah, so we're going to connect the bits of our output to the count from the counter. And um, the question is, well, what should we attach valid to? Valid is kind of indicating this is legitimate data. Uh, in this particular problem instance, I've decided to, uh, you know, use the enable to the counter as a whole as kind of an indication this is a valid count. But that's not necessarily you know, always the case. You may have other logic you use to connect to the uh, valid. So um, if you go ahead and generate the Verilog, right, uh, it's not super uh, surprising, right? You know, if we see, for example, we have this notion of 
when should we bounce the counter, right? It's when things are ready and enabled. And you can see, okay, if we're advancing, it's going to, um, uh, you know, have the new value, right? And wrap values simply to value plus one. Okay. Uh, you know, and because this is, you know, that nice library count, which is optimized, it's doing this all very gracefully because it's the power of two number of things. For example, if we made this uh, three things, it would need to, you know, do the comparison, see am I, am I at the max value and do I need to kind of manually wrap? But hey, guess what? We're at a power of two like we had before, in which case it's, it would recognize that it's naturally going to wrap on its own. It doesn't need to have a special comparator. That's all done by that chill library counter, right? But for us, the key thing to notice in this example is just, yes, we declared this as decoupled. By default, it says in this output direction, right? So from the point of view of this module, uh, you know, the bits and the valid are in the output direction, and then the ready comes in the ops direction as an input, right? That's coming in. Uh, and thus, we you know we can use ready as a value in some of our signals, but we need to set bits and valid because those are outputs from our module, right? We need to kind of uh, the, attach those and drive those. Cool. Um, questions on this? Cool. Um, so, the, it's more than just simply declaring additional I.O. fields for us, the helper functions. There's actually things that are associated with these uh, bundles, right? So, um, you may feel like, okay, well, I'm constantly doing, you know, this and this or this and something else. There's actually methods we can call on these interfaces that will uh, instantiate the thing we're talking about. So, for example, you might see someone use fire. That's true if and only if ready and valid, right? So, you know, we want to advance things, right? Both on the producer and consumer when that happens, right? So when that happens, that's, that's, a, that's a fire, right? Or if I want to send data, well, that's enqueuing, right? Or if I perhaps want to indicate the fact that I'm not sending data, that's a no enqueue. Um, and it's also a DQ and no DQ. Um, so maybe it's better if we see an example of this. Uh, okay, so if we... Uh, Take our count when ready. Um, we're still going to use the counter uh, helper functions, right? The difference is now we're going to um, uh, use the IO enable a little bit differently, right? In this case, we're going to, uh, when enable is true, uh, yes, we want to um, count, but we also want to um, indicate that, right? So. Uh, you know, you saw on the prior slide, uh, you know, we attach the uh, valid directly to the enable and we use the um, advanced counter, you know, as you know, when enable and the ready to do this. Well, um, the enable we're kind of treating like valid, right? So, uh, well, basically we want the counter to count when there's both we're ready and valid. So we can just use dot fire, right? This is basically ready and valid at the same time. So we can... Have that be dot fire, cool. Um, and remember, before we kind of attached IO enable directly to like you know the the valid or valid directly to enable. Here we're kind of reproducing that. This is really verbose to kind of show what's happening functionally. Uh, you wouldn't write it this way. You would probably write it more like the way uh, I've commented out, right? And it's going to produce the exact same behavior. We're basically, hey, if I'm you know trying to do something. I'm going to go ahead and enqueue the value, right? So it's a little bit of a mind warp, right? Where here we are calling a Scala method on a chisel thing, right? And we're actually intending this not just to be something that's run uh, at generation. So this is technically something that's run at generation time. It's not going to run at runtime, but we want to have a certain residual hardware that's going to have and be impactful at runtime. So in particular, uh, you know, when we call dot enqueue, or maybe it's better to start with dot fire we're saying ready and valid. So maybe to best uh, convey this, what I'm going to do is go back a slide um, and actually I'm going to pull up the code for these decoupled helper functions, right? So if we go look into the uh, GitHub, hopefully this popped up. Uh, here we go. We can see, for example, how is fire defined? We won't worry about all the crazy Scala stuff up here, but you know, how is fire defined? Uh, it's simply, are we ready and valid? And so this is just returning that little chisel snippet to us, right? It's of type bool. That's, you know, a, a chisel type. It's not Boolean like the Scala type. It's the chisel type. So, yeah. When I call dot fire, it's going to replace it with this, right? 
Um, and so uh, you can see, for example, uh, you know, if I call NQ, what is NQ going to do? Well, NQ is going to, uh, there's some data I'm trying to send. Well, I'm, of course, going to attach that data to the bits, right? And I'm also going to set valid to true, right? Because, yeah, I'm sending data. This is valid data. However, for example, if I'm doing a no NQ, as I don't have data to send, valid is going to be false. Um, as a small aside, you may be noticing that the bits get set to don't care. Uh, so Chisel does have a don't care value. This basically is saying that I'm, you know, embracing the fact this is undefined. <laughs> um, this may seem like an odd thing to do, but there are times where uh, you really don't care about the value of something and you want to convey it to the tools and tools, knowing something doesn't matter, can actually optimize in a certain way. Uh, if you also just put some sort of arbitrary number there, that should be the equivalent of a don't care, except for it's not quite the equivalent, right? It's going to do the right things. If it's truly a don't care, that means your hardware doesn't depend on the value of it. But by hard coding that value as opposed to having a don't care, give the tools a little more freedom to kind of optimize and deal with it, right? Um, don't care is kind of a subtle detail. You can get through this course just fine, never using it. Um, but I include it just because that's technically what's going on under the hood, right? We saw that, you know, when I say, hey, dot no in queue, What's it doing? Attaching bits that don't care and valid defaults. That's what we saw in this code right here. Um, and yes, there's also a DQ and no DQ. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of cool. We can kind of see how um, these things all fit together. So uh, this is, you know, the declaration of the module. If we go ahead and, you know, actually instantiate this counter. So we're going to go ahead and run it a few cycles and um, let's see what we get. I might need to zoom out for this one. And yeah, we can see that, for example, we're only going to say the output's ready. We're always going to be enabled, so it's always going to be valid. But when is it ready? It's only going to be ready on odd cycles, right? So we see that, for example, the count is only incrementing every other cycle because it's only firing every other cycle, right? So it's only when uh, it's firing or able to actually advance that counter. Cool. I'm going to pause here for questions. This is definitely heavy at times. In the tester. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so maybe a good way to think about this is um, there is the, uh, you know, count when ready module. And there is this tester I've kind of created around it, right? And a tester has both inputs and outputs, right? Um, in this case, the tester is kind of, from the point of view of the print line, it's the consumer, right? So uh, the tester is, you know, manually setting ready and saying, hey, I either am or am not ready to receive. And when it's now, of course, not ready, uh, nothing advances. When it is ready, it's advancing because we're kind of by making it always valid, by making enable always true because we attached are enabled to valid, right? But um, yeah, so in this case, the test bench is kind of wrapping everything. And it's kind of forcing the count when ready module to be a producer and to be in the driving state, always kind of always valid. And that this portion of the tester, we know we're kind of saying the ready is when we're kind of controlling our consumption. And we're saying every other cycle, I am ready or I'm not ready to receive and, you know, we're printing the value every time we see based on the counter, it's only advancing when we were both ready and valid. That's kind of where we're kind of tracking that. Um, so that's kind of the idea. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's good to kind of draw boxes and be aware of what's inputs and what's outputs. But the key thing for ready valid is that, yeah, with a couple of interfaces ready valid, uh, you know, things advance when it's ready and valid. A lot of times you only need valid. Uh, you know, dedicated hardware on the receiving end, on the consuming end, so. It doesn't have a need to have back pressure. But when you have a need to have back pressure, uh, then yes, then you want to have ready and valid. Uh, and these library functions help us kind of wrap it up. We have this notion that, you know, we can, you know, write this out and, you know, it's going to go ahead and do this. So you can imagine the alternative. Right? The alternative would be, I would need to say, hey, val, you know, out uh, bits, you know, and then val out, you know, uh, valid. And then, you know, val out 
ready. And then of course I got to remember to declare it at the bits as an output, but the valid's an output, but the ready is an input, right? So you can see already that these helper functions make our life easier because I have to, you know, I just mark this as decoupled. It's a standard thing. It's ready valid. Uh, people can just read my code. It's less code for me to maintain and change. Uh, and then, yeah, these extra little wrinkles of having you no know, dot fire, dot NQ, those are pretty extra, to be honest, right? Like, if you, you can write perfectly fine chisel code without those, uh, I think it can be better if you can use them sometimes because, you know, these are recognizable patterns to some people. Um, but that's that's a bit extra. And like I said, if you're unsure about that, you, of course, can go back to the link. Uh, oops, uh, I had on the prior slide about the code. Um, and since this actually is technically a ready valid I.O., if I go, sorry, uh, if I go here, we can probably also find a Scala doc for it. Let's see if I'm not crazy. Um... There's a lot here, but uh, I think inside of here, does it have the like dot fire? Maybe, maybe not. Um, we'll see, uh, something to check later on. But <laughs> uh, okay, good, uh, additional questions. Okay, um, so let's keep rolling then. Um, so we were talking about decoupling things and you can decouple a single link between two components. However, to have yet more effective decoupling, uh, you can have a queue in between it, right? Because if I have two components, uh, you know, one's producing, one's consuming, you know, if the producer wants to produce and the consumer is not ready, or if let's say the consumer is ready and the producer has anything new, they both might be idle, right? But if I have a queue in between the two, I can use that queue to kind of balance out uh, a, uh, a awkwardness in the traffic, right? So for example, if I have um, a situation where, uh, you know, it's very bursty, where I you know producer produces four things in a row, the consumer takes some amount of time to process each one, but on average, the, throw, the flow rates are the same, a queue is a great way to handle that, right? Where I can, you know, if one end's not ready, they can just check the queue, right? So for example, if the producer is ready to produce, is ready to have valid things to produce, but the consumer's not ready for them, you kind of have this in pile, right? You know, this incoming pile where you can put things in the queue. Likewise, the um, consumer uh, can kind of have this backlog waiting for itself with its queue, and that way it can kind of keep things busy. Uh, if you've ever been to like an institution of some sort and you've had been annoyed to wait in line, perhaps at the airport, it's one thing to realize, uh, for example, that if you are worried about staffing prices, you know, for example, how many people do you have screening at the airport? Uh, if there's no line, as a traveler, we love that, right? Oh yeah, no wait, no line, this is great. Uh, from a you know efficiency standpoint uh, point of view, uh, that's actually inefficient, right? Because that means they have, at that moment, more resources than demand, right? Um, and so a queue, i.e. a line, is a way to kind of counter that, right? If there's always a line, uh, that implies, if there's a line, that implies that the uh, consumption is, uh, you know, not exceeding the production, right? In which case, that means you aren't over-provisioning things. And so that's a very crazy real-world example. But going back to hardware, um, queues are really helpful, right? Um, we can put things into a queue and pull things out of a queue. And so a uh, really good way to couple things are now if the production rates and consumption if they're bursty, you know, if one's really kind of producing things at a different rate, you can kind of handle this. But the key thing about queues to understand uh, is that they only will handle bur burstiness differences. They won't handle raw differences, right? Like, if this thing always produces twice as many things as this thing, this thing's going to be a, a bottleneck, right? It's not going to have uh, enough throughput to handle that, right? So if there's just a fundamental throughput mismatch, uh, the queue won't solve it, right? But if you have a difference, right? If you have, let's say, you know, in the case of an airport, people all getting off a plane all at once is a huge burst, but then there's not a plane for a while and there's a little bit of a gap and you do time to drain the queue, right? Um, and so why are we talking about all this? Well, queues are a great way to decouple components. So you have a little bit more flexibility. The producer consumer aren't as tightly linked or more decoupled, is that kind of that keyword. Um, but also, of course, internally, that queue is going to use decoupled interfaces. So in particular, a queue is going to have a decoupled NQ and a decoupled DQ, right? Where in, so in this case, what's happening is, you know, when you're talking to a queue, the queue is indicating, you know, if you're on the NQ side, 
do we have room to take more data, right? If the queue is not not full, uh, yes, I have room to take more data. Great. Uh, if the queue is full, yeah, no, I'm I'm not going to be ready. I can't take more data, right? Likewise, if you're the consumer, right? Uh, you know, your ability to take DQ, you know, is this valid coming on this DQ line? That corresponds to is this queue empty or not, right? If this queue is um, empty, well, then there's not valid data because it's nothing there. But if there is valid data and it's not empty, then yeah, you can know that, right? And a queue is only going to advance if this person says okay, right? So uh, a queue is a really helpful uh, feature in this library, which has, you know, the couples on both sides. So we can go ahead and play with this a little bit. So uh, as I said, you can think of both sides as being decoupled, right? So here we showed it as just, oh yeah, NQ, DQ. But remember, when something's decoupled, it has bits for the actual payload, ready and valid. So you can see that kind of expanded out, right? And you know, the ready and valid are going in opposite directions. Uh, you know, and so typically the way you declare a queue is you use this, uh, you know, helper fun uh, you know, convenience function. So you can say, hey, I want a queue. Oops. Uh, give it a type. I want four bit, uh, you know, unsigned integers and then number of entries, right? How deep is this queue? Uh, there's some additional arguments. We'll come to these in a few minutes. Uh, so I'll hold off on this for now. Uh, but the idea is, yeah, in this case, I'm declaring, you know, a queue that's going to have uh, eight entries, right? So under the hood, these queues are going to be implemented with registers, right? So it's going to actually have, you know, eight forward registers in uh, doing that kind of stuff. So let's go ahead and maybe see an example real quick. So in this case, we're going to have a module that is a counter followed by a queue. So, uh, you know, the counting is counting into the queue. And what's cool about this is, you know, um, remember the prior example we kind of running with this lecture, we had a counter producing a decoupled interface. It's still kind of a counter producing a decoupled interface. It's just, there's a queue inside. So now if the receiver, for example, is unable to accept these counts coming in, we can actually get a couple of them already into that queue for us, kind of buffer them up, right? Uh, and so uh, how does this play out? Well, we of course need to instantiate a queue. But if you haven't seen the syntax already in this course, when you instantiate the module in Chisel, you don't just need to say new that uh, class name, you actually also need to wrap it inside module. This is a little bit of a wrinkle from having embedded DSL, but you need to say, hey, this is a module. Okay, so you, you do that. All right, so we've instantiated a queue. This queue came from the uh, you know Chisel library. Um, and then what do we have inside here? Of course, we're also instantiating a counter from the library and we're gonna, we're gonna connect them up, right? So we can say, hey, um, when is the uh, incoming thing for this queue valid? Well, uh, like before, we were kind of using this IO enables entire module as a, our way of indicating things are valid. Uh, rather than hard coding this to one, we want to indicate the fact that maybe a producer isn't always producing. Um, of course, the bits going into the queue, those are from the count, right? Uh, and then um, as an interesting thing, you also have this bolt connection operator, right? So here we have uh, an output, which is decoupled. And the Q has the DQ side, which also is decoupled. Here we're doing a bolt connect, right? So we're saying we know under the hood that, you know, because this is decoupled, there's the dot bits, the dot ready, a dot valid. The dot ready and dot valid are going different directions. Uh, so rather than doing, you know, three lines of, you know, connections, I can just connect these all together, right? These are um, the right, uh, you know, they, ma they match field by field. They're in the right directions, right? The DQ is in the flipped direction because that's coming to the other side, um, et cetera. And then um, this extra line where I'm attaching the count to io.count, uh, that's just us being able to kind of get access to that field easily. Um, that's not necess always necessary. Okay, so this is our uh, code for this. Um, question from chat, uh, why does module need a, um, sorry, why does Q need a module wrapper when counter does not? Good question. Uh, so the answer is, <laughs> this is not something that's very deliberate. It's kind of more of a, uh, you're coping with the constraints of an embedded DSL. So remember from our prior conversations using the counter standard library component from Chisel, right? This is from a Chisel library. Counter is not a module, right? This is this some some chisel snippets um and so yeah so you can 
create chill snippets and classes and functions, pass them around, uh, and that's totally fine. The only constraint is eventually need up inside a module, right? So we have to have, you know, this thing be a module. If you're actually instantiating a module and Q is actually a module, not just random ch chisel snippets, um, then you need to use this module keyword to mark it as a module and treat it. And basically this is kind of just some underhood stuff. You know, we kind of, when we create chisel snippets, we forget, you know, that we're actually creating this, you know, design graph and connecting things. And it's kind of a lot of like hidden state kind of flowing around of our uh, design, you know, it's kind of tracking, oh yes, this is the top level module and these things all kind of live together. And so yeah, there's some under the hood stuff the language is doing uh, to kind of keep track of this. And so yeah, when you instantiate a module, it's actually a module. You need to use this module keyword at the point of instantiation. If it's just some chisel snippets you're generating, you don't need it. That's what's going on here. But yeah, it, it, this is not something that a human deliberately chose. This is more them uh, coping with the possibilities and choosing this to be the least bad outcome. And at first it may seem a little crazy, but uh, it's not the worst, right? You eventually get used to it. <laughs> um, good question. Okay, so yeah, we, of course we can look at the Verilog. Uh, it's gonna be pretty complicated. Um, so why is this Verilog so complicated? Uh, there's a few things going on, right? First is that because Q is a, its own module, the Verilog is also gonna have its own module for that Q. Uh, one thing uh, I'm not gonna cover today, we'll cover in a future lecture, is how much you go about building such a Q. Uh, for today, I'm telling you, think of it as registers. When it's actually gets synthesized by a hardware tool, it's going to be registers. However, um, there are the way we write it, we use the mem construct, and you actually can write it in a way where you can technically use something like SRAM. You actually could have be have asynchronous memory. That could be possible in some cases. And so, yeah, the generated Verilog seems really complicated because actually it's using a chisel mem inside the library component. Uh, but like I said, it's kind of more when you see, but even inside Arthur, you can see, oh my gosh, there's all this stuff going on, right? I have to kind of declare um, all these things for the queue, connect all these things for the queue. Yeah, there's a lot going on from a very little bit of chisel. So we're getting a little bit of expressive power here, right? And this is not uh, a case of, you know, unbelievable inference or high level synthesis by the tools. No, this is very direct mechanical application of things that people have written, right? Where, hey, you know, I'm declaring decoupled. When I say decoupled, I get, you know, those three fields. I get the dot bits, the dot valid, the dot ready, right? Or, you know, I do a bulk connect. I'm going to go through and connect all those things field by field. Or someone's already made a queue module. I'm just going to instantiate that and take advantage of that. And it's going to go through all that. Okay. Other questions so far? Cool. Okay. Um, so we have a place to kind of try this out and I can keep tweaking these parameters and kind of keep seeing it play out. So, uh, I'm going to keep doing different parameters and, you know, perhaps you might, some might click, but if you have questions, please stop me or interrogate me. Um, so we have our module and a reminder of our parameters. This is the maximum valid. This is the number of things we're counting. So we're counting four things. So it's zero, one, two, three. Um, we're saying our Q depth is three, and let's temporarily, we'll not worry about pipe and flow. Okay, so we're gonna say, hey, you know what? It's always valid, let's try and enable that counter. Um, however, we're gonna have three phases in our test case, right? We are going to fill the Q up, meaning that the receiver is not ready. So whoever's consuming this module, they're saying they're not ready. Then we're gonna have this other time period where we're gonna drain the Q, where we're gonna say, hey, you know what? We're not creating anything valid but we're ready to receive, right? So the consumer is going to pull it out. And then at the end, we're going to turn it both on at the same time. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. Uh, and we see, yeah, you know, if we ran this uh, example that, uh, you know, the counter uh, is able to keep counting despite the fact that the um, uh, receiver is not ready because it's going into the queue, right? So even though the receiver is not taking it, it's putting values into the queue. And you can see that, uh, you know, then in the drain phase, what is the uh, receiver getting from the out? You can see now they say they're ready that, uh, yeah, they're getting valid data, zero, one, two. Um, why is there not a three here? Well, the queue only has room for three things, right? So if it made us have room for four, then yes, we could go ahead and get, you know, 
0, 1, 2, 3 into the queue, and we could pull out 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, likewise, if my queue, let's say, had depth of only 1, uh, you know, okay, well, I could put one thing into the queue, and I can get one thing out of the queue, but, you know, uh, that's going to kind of be the end of that. So let's go back to our example of having 3. Um, okay, so, you know, we had a 3 deep queue, so we put in 3 numbers, 0, 1, 2, into it, uh, and then on the receiving end, um, you know, later on we're draining that queue, we get 0, 1, 2 out. Uh, it was only 3 deep, so that's why there's nothing else coming out. Uh, what if we start enqueuing and dequeuing at the same time? Well, then, you know, for example, uh, because it has to get into the queue before it can get out of the queue, the queue at this point is empty, right? Valid is false. So, okay, we, we have a, you know, empty queue. So first we got to put it into the queue the first cycle. Then the next cycle, it can be pulled out, right? And uh, while we're pulling out that three, it's enqueuing a zero from having wrapped around the next time on that counter. So you can pull it out, right? So if both sides are, you know, able to operate, you know, we're doing a dot fire is both ready and valid. Then we get that nice pipeline kind of behavior, you know, it comes in, goes through, comes in, goes through. Um, cool. Okay, questions on this so far? Okay, let's talk about pipe and flow. Uh, these are kind of, you know, extra features on these queues. Uh, people spend a lot of time with queues. That's why there's always kind of wrinkles to them. Um, so let's, let's talk about them, right? So if you think about a queue, there's certain corner cases you want to know how it's going to behave, right? So, uh, you know, if I have a really big queue and let's say it's like half full and I'm enqueuing and dequeuing, you know, something's come in, something's come out, enqueuing, dequeuing the same cycle, the behavior is pretty well understood, but it's some corner cases, right? Well, what happens if, um, I have a really small queue. In particular, I have a queue of one entry. If I have a single entry queue, uh, can I enqueue and dequeue at the same time, right? Think about it for a second. Normally, you would think the hardware, if I have a single entry queue, it's that either you have kind of two halves, right? It's kind of the, the dequeue half is saying, well, am I empty or am I full? Okay, if I'm empty, no, I can't dequeue. If I'm full, yes, I can dequeue. Uh, likewise, um, on the NQ side, you can imagine kind of thinking about, okay, well, uh, is there something in there? No? Okay, I'm, I'm empty. I can take a data value. Oh, if something is there? No, I'm full. I can't take any data value. So you can kind of imagine that the NQ and DQ halves are kind of, you know, two halves of the same queue, and they operate independently. However, if you have a single entry, you can imagine scenarios where uh, I have an element there, and because I'm DQing that cycle, I know I can NQ at the same time, right? And so um, that only makes sense if you have the two halves talk to each other. So that's a feature called pipe. And, you know, if one, you can enqueue and dequeue at the same time on a one entry queue. It's kind of a really uh, interesting corner case. It's also not just with one entry deep. It's also if you have a bigger one. It's just basically if it's full, are you able to, more generally the question is, is it full? I'm able to, you know, enqueue at the same time dequeuing, right? Taking advantage of the fact that this is happening. So you may be wondering why this is not the default behavior. The reason why is by having this capability, you have the NQ side talking to the DQ side, which may not be good uh, from the point of view of combinational loops, right? So you kind of make a connection there, and depending on the rest of the logic of your system, that may not be okay. Or even if it's not creating a combinational loop, it may also increase your clock period and your critical path, in which case you don't want that. So this is optional. Um, that's pipe. The other one of these uh, interesting little wrinkles is something called flow, and that is... If my queue is empty, can I just bypass the queue without being saved, right? So in other words, you know, if I have an empty queue and someone's trying to dequeue, and the same thing as someone's trying to dequeue on empty queue, someone's enqueuing, rather than writing that value to the queue and making them wait a cycle to get it the next cycle, can you just flow right through? It's kind of like a bypass sheet, shortcut, whatever you want to call it. So that's a flow argument. So uh, those things kind of really come out in some of these kind of corner cases, right? So for example, let's... Uh, maybe do uh, the for pipe first. So let's say uh, get down to one entry, um, and you know, uh, really let's zoom curve with simultaneous case. And yeah, it's kind of painful, right? Okay, I have a zero, then I gotta you know fill it, I get a one in there, fill it, pull it. If I pipeline this, I should be able to kind of do both at the same time, right? So we come down to that case. Oops. Uh, 
why won't let me scroll? Um, if I uh, come down to that case, we can see, yes, you know, I'm enqueuing and dequeuing simultaneously, right? So I have a single entry and I keep, you know, emptying and populating it at the same time. And you see there's, there's still kind of that one cycle delay between when things are from the count and when it's read because it's going to register, right? It's going to that one register in between. Uh, if I was to use that flow feature to let it bypass it, uh, you would see, I might have broken this, hopefully I didn't, uh, maybe I did, but you, you, you would be seeing uh, it going straight through. Maybe it's better if I make this too deep. Um, I may have broken my interpreter, but <laughs> uh, we'll leave it at that, but you would see them going straight through. You'd see, okay, zero, it's kind of basically bypassing the queue and it comes straight through the other side, uh, et cetera. Okay, uh, well, I think we've run out of time, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording, but I will stick around for any last minute questions.